Okay, thanks for the invitation. Um, and welcome to the talk on optical stimulated luminescence dating, abbreviated OSL dating in geoarchaeological research. <coughs> After an introduction, I will explain briefly okay. the basics. Just talk there because translator can mm -hmm. hear you. Uh, after an introduction, I will, uh, I hope, to explain briefly the basics of OSL dating. Then I will present a case study and will conclude the talk. So, geoarchaeologists uh, or geoarchaeological research uh, is often concerned with human environmental relationships. So, basically, with the left side of this diagram which depicts the socio-ecological system. So questions are raised on at what time did uh, humans colonize uh, a certain landscape and what effects had this colonization or this work on the environment. And in turn, for example, uh, which events led to an abandonment of a landscape. <coughs> Often, the only available archive to study such questions are um, alluvial or colluvial sediments, so slope sediments. Um, and the dating of those sediments, the absolute dating uh, of those sediments, is necessary, for example, to link certain observed phenomena to the archaeological record, <coughs> and vice versa. Nowadays, um, earth scientists and archaeologists can choose from a variety of dating methods, and the most common method uh, in dating colluvial and alluvial sediments is radiocarbon dating. <coughs> However, this might be problematic because, for example, of the old wood effect or of constant reworking uh, of the organic material or simply because datable organic material is absent in the uh, sediment archive. Um, optical stimulated <coughs> luminescence dating has recently become a common method to date uh, fluvial or colluvial sediments. But what is OSL dating? Here on the left you see a colleague of mine who hammers an opaque tube into the sediment body so that the sampled sediment is not exposed to daylight. And this is important because optical stimulated luminescence dating determines the time that has elapsed since sediment was last exposed to daylight. So if he would simply take a shovel and pull out the sediments and expose the uh, sediments to daylight, he would not get the age uh, of deposition of uh, the sediments here, but the date when he sampled the sediments. And why is that? <coughs> Um, when sediments are buried and sealed from daylight, so <coughs> under another layers of sediments, um, ionizing radiation uh, resulting from um, uranium or tiny uranium or um, kalium particles um, or uh, s um, mineral grains are able to absorb those uh, ionizing radiation in the form of energy. <clears throat> so the longer the sediments or the mineral grains are uh, buried and sealed from daylight, the more energy is stored in the mineral grains, in the crystal lattice of the mineral grains. So now if the old sediments and the energy gradually builds up so the longer it is buried, the more energy is absorbed. <clears throat> uh, 
And now if uh, the sediments are eroded and exposed to day daylight and transported, the energy is released in form of luminescence. <clears throat> so I take the sample, sealed from daylight, bring it to the laboratory, artificially stimulate the mineral grain and measure the luminescence signal coming from the crystal, from the uh, uh, mineral. So to calculate the age, I need uh, the intensity of the luminescence signal, uh, which is called the equivalent dose. And I need to know how much radiation comes from the surrounding sediments. This is per year, this is the dose rate. So H equals equivalent dose divided by the dose rate. This works fine for sediments uh, which are um, equally bleached. Bleaching is uh, the process, the resetting process. This uh, is, for example, in wind transported sediments, they are well bleached. However, if the exposure to sunlight is limited, for example, when the erosion process is during night or uh, during a cloudy day or it's very rapid, some energy remains in the crystal lattice. This is the residual signal. And if I would then measure uh, the luminescence, I would not get the correct last date of deposition, but I would overestimate the H. <clears throat> there are methods to overcome this problem. This, for example, this incomplete bleaching process occurs in uh, when sediments uh, are uh, transported by rivers or the like. However, um, methods, new methods uh, use only small subsamples or a lot of small subsamples from the sediment sample up to 10 grains per sample or only one grain per sample and measure the luminescence intensity of each of this grain. So you get a distribution of different um, equivalent doses. <coughs> And now, um, so this, for example, this uh, result would be an older age than, for example, this one, but coming from the same sediment, uh, sediment population. <clears throat> so now to determine the correct age of the last um, deposition event, I have to uh, apply an appropriate, uh, appropriate statistical age model which um, uh, only takes the well-bleached samples into account. And uh, the most common is the minimum age model. Okay, so far uh, to the basics of OSL. And now I come to the case study, uh, which I worked on uh, during my PhD. Uh, it was about the cultural landscape around a Nabataean Roman uh, city in Jordan, <coughs> located in Southwest Asia, um, in the uh, Eastern Highlands. Uh, Petra was famous for its uh, rock carved uh, monuments and was founded around the first century uh, BC and existed until the fourth century uh, AD. <coughs> the Environment is very rugged, mountainous, and arid. So, uh, yeah, it's arid with a winter rain regime. <coughs> and um, agriculture was only possible to uh, applying a thousand year old um, or thousands of year old uh, technique. Uh, here we studied uh, those areas to the north, a few kilometers to the north and the northwest of Petra, which were uh, cultivated. Uh, and they applied so-called uh, terraced wadi systems. And those systems are um, stone walls, which are placed in uh, small wadis or dry land streams or dry streams, <coughs> dry valleys. Uh, 
a series of stone walls and with sediment bodies behind which uh, served as the area of cultivation and as a water reservoir. <coughs> Here you see a satellite image of those systems. In red are the walls. Uh, up until recently, the age of those um, terraces was not known because they were only dated with surface pottery, and this is uh, problematic, so the age was under debate. So the question of the case study was, how old are these terraces? What is the chronology of this cultural landscape? And this was not so easy to determine because in most of the terraces, organic, datable organic material is absent. So uh, we applied optical stimulated OSL dating uh, and radiocarbon dating where datable organic material was present. And why should OSL dating work here? So the terraces are usually built by setting a row of stones into a wadi bed. Then the occasional flash floods, they are damped uh, behind those dams and the and, and trained sediments settle so that a sediment body builds up and if this reservoir is built another row of stones is set on top so the terraces usually gradually uh, get um, larger uh, not larger but they increase in height so what we did is we uh, took samples from the sediment body and from underneath the base stones of the terrace walls, assuming that <laughs> the sediments were reworked during construction. <coughs> and here are the results. So here you see the uh, sample site. This is a catchment of such a terraced wadi system. And uh, the uh, sample from underneath the base stone was actually the oldest, 330 plus minus 420 BC. And the initial filling followed by the initial filling of the terrace, 440 plus minus 300 AD. And uh, the youngest sample was on top, 730 plus minus 180 AD. What is also... Um, Noteworthy is the change of the stratigraphy from a gravel bed to, um, to fine materials on the level of the terrace walls. <coughs> uh, we found this pattern in all of the sampled terraced wadi systems, and this was also confirmed by the radiocarbon dating, which showed uh, that the sedimentation of fine materials in context with terrace walls started um, around the first century <coughs> AD and lasted up to the 8th or 9th century AD. Um, to conclude this case study, um, the environment of Petra was uh, characterized or dominated by high-energy fluvial processes up until the uh, first century AD, so no agriculture was possible here. Then the um, Nabataeans built those terraces and cultivation was, was possible and they, not the Nabataeans, but other people, they used it uh, up at least until the 8th century AD. So 400 years longer than the city of Petra existed. And sometime after, we don't know when, the terraces were abandoned and then dissected and eroded and only rarely are cultivated nowadays. The problem now was we wanted to determine also when the terraces were abandoned. But um, you, here you see uh, an interior delta of all the streams 
uh, descending from the highlands where Petra was located. So you would assume the sediments coming from the terraces somewhere here, but we couldn't find an appropriate um, um, sediment archive to uh, date uh, the stratigraphy or if there's an accelerated erosion and deposition rate after the abandonment of the terraces. So to conclude, uh, OSL dating is applicable in archaeological and geoarchaeological research, especially when radiocarbon dating is problematic or organic material is absent. But as with any dating method, without an appropriate sediment archive, every dating uh, is senseless or where you can explain all the processes which led to the formation of the uh, sediments, all dating uh, fails to answer your research questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.